This is our third look at the cardiovascular system, and in this lecture we are going to be looking at vessels. There's a picture here up at the top of the screen where you can see the cross-section of the three major vessels in the body, veins, arteries, and capillaries, and we're going to talk a little bit about each one. So we're going to start with arteries. Remember that arteries are attached directly to the heart, or the aorta, and pulmonary arteries are attached directly to the heart, and they are carrying blood away from the heart at usually pretty high pressure. As the arteries get further and further from the heart, the pressure begins to decrease, and the arteries get smaller and smaller and become a smaller vessel called an arteriole. The layers of artery, arterial, veins, and venules are all the same. Their walls have the same three layers, and here's what those layers are. From the inside, we have a layer called the tunica interna. It is made up of just very simple epithelial cells, as well as some connective tissue like elastic and collagen, which helps to allow the walls of the artery to expand and contract with blood flow and with pressure. The epithelial cells help to keep that pathway as smooth as possible. The next layer is the tunica media. That's the thickest middle layer. So if we look over here, the tunica interna is this, here's a cross section, it's this thin little layer here. The tunica media is that really thick red layer. You can see um, it takes up the majority of the space right here and it is the thickest and takes up the most space because it is made of muscle and very thick and dense elastic tissue. What that allows for is when the blood leaves the heart at really high pressure it allows the walls of the artery to expand with that pressure and then to rebound or contract back down. It keeps the walls from stretching out and from becoming damaged in most cases. The outermost layer is called the tunica externa, so externa means outside. Tunica externa is a very thin layer. It is mostly made up of connective tissue and that allows it to attach to surrounding tissues like muscles and organs so that the vessels are not constantly shifting position. So I spoke a little bit about the walls of the arteries and how it, they are built to withstand changes in size. Um, there are some nerve controls within the body that um, regulate the opening and closing of blood vessels. Not complete opening and closing, but rather um, the dilating or expanding the size <clears throat> excuse me, of the vessel or contraction, which narrows the size of the vessel. Um, that is an autonomically controlled process, so it is something beyond your conscious control. The brain monitors and makes those decisions for you. And it does so in order to either increase blood flow, so if the vessels are dilating, we get an increase in flow, and if the vessels are constricting, we get a decrease in blood flow. That would be maybe because the body is cold, so we want to decrease blood flow to the skin while keeping at higher blood flow near the organs. Um, it could be because there's been some kind of change in pressure. But what can also occur in terms of changing artery size is if the wall of the artery is somehow weakened, and if you look over here at this picture, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. There's this thin patch in the wall as the pressure of blood flowing goes past that, what happens is blood flow would like to go here, but now you've got this little thin patch, so it's leaking into this area as well. I mean, some of it is passing directly by, but a bunch of it is going to leak in here. And eventually what will happen is that can burst and split open. That is called an aneurysm. If that happens in the brain, it is called a stroke. An aneurysm can happen anywhere. One that happens in the brain specifically is called a stroke. Okay, so as we're moving away from arteries, we're getting further and further from the heart, and so now we're out in small tissues or distant tissues like fingertips, toes, um, the skin itself. Then we get into capillaries. So capillaries are the tiniest of all the vessels. They are extremely thin, so they are about 
the size of a human hair. Um, the walls themselves do not have the tunica media or the tunica externa. They only have the internal layer and it is just a single cell um, thick. Also, in between those epithelial cells are little tiny openings. Those openings allow for materials to move in and out of the capillary. So things that would be moving in would be things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, we would have small waste products, there would be water. All of these things are moving back and forth between the tissues of the body and the capillaries. In places where there's a lot of cellular activity, a lot of metabolism, there's a lot of capillaries. So this would be places like muscles, maybe say your bicep, which is constantly lifting things, holding things, moving things, writing, texting. So those muscles have to get lots of blood flow so that they are constantly getting oxygen to perform their jobs. Sometimes it's important to slow down blood flow or even stop it altogether. So think about when you are outside, maybe you're at a football game and it's really, really, really cold and you're not wearing any gloves. Your body wants to keep heat close to the important organs. So your heart, your brain, all of that. And it wants to minimize heat loss to the environment. So let's say these were the capillaries of your fingertips. There are little vessels, little muscles right here called precapillary sphincters. Those muscles might close off blood flow to the capillaries in your fingertips for a while to keep blood here deeper inside the body where it will help stay warm. And if we need to increase blood flow, just the opposite occurs. The precapillary sphincters might open up and allow for more blood flow. So just as I mentioned in the last slide, many different materials are moving in and out of capillaries. So in the movement from the capillary to the tissue, we are delivering oxygen and nutrients. The opposite is movement from the tissue, like muscles, back to the capillaries. And in those cases, we would be moving things like waste and carbon dioxide. Water is going to move in both directions at all times. Um, larger materials like plasma, large proteins, very large sugars, never ever leave the capillaries. They're far too big to fit through the little openings in the walls, so they just continue on through the blood and um, work in other organs and other tissues and are used by other substances elsewhere. As we move through capillaries, the blood pressure is very low, so I'm going to well, if my pen will write, I'm going to abbreviate blood pressure is very low in capillaries because the flow is very, very slow. When you have a very thin pipe, it requires movement through that pipe to be really, really slow. Okay, so now we're leaving capillaries and the blood needs to return back to the heart to be reoxygenated by the lungs and all of those other things that need to happen. So capillaries empty, we're looking at about this point here, right? Capillaries are those tiny little vessels. The capillaries empty into larger vessels called venules, and then the venules empty into very large vessels called veins. Veins, again, have the same three wall layers as the arteries. Um, but the big difference here is that the middle muscle layer of veins is very, very thin and it is super um, stretched out. So there's not a lot of shape to veins. They kind of can be squ squished down and flattened. And they also have an internal structure called a valve. Just like the heart has valves, the veins have these swinging door valves that make sure that blood only moves in this direction. So blood pushes through the doors and then the doors close behind. That keeps blood constantly moving toward the heart. Okay, so some of the problems that can happen within the vessels themselves. We already talked about stroke and aneurysm if a wall becomes damaged, but there is also a very serious condition in the U.S. as huge incidence of this called atherosclerosis. So that means vessel hardening. So what happens here is the vessels become hardened because a bunch of fat and plaque 
ends up building up on the inside of the blood vessel wall. And you can see that in a picture down here. The top one is a normal artery. The middle one is atherosclerosis artery. So lots of fat builds up. You can see that there's very little space for blood to move through. So what ends up happening there is we get a much higher blood pressure because the heart has to push really hard to get all of the blood through that tiny little space. That can also cause blood to get jammed up in there. I don't know if you can see this, but right down here we've got a blood clot. And what happens with a blood clot is now we've got all this blood trying to pass through here and it's blocked off. So what ends up happening is everything on this side dies. The tissue begins to die because it's not getting oxygen, it's not getting nutrients, and that can be really serious. If this was in the heart, so that's what this picture here is, a, an artery of the heart, that can cause a heart attack. If it happens in the brain, it can cause a stroke. Um, if it happens elsewhere, you can get an aneurysm or tissue death. Some of the common causes for atherosclerosis you could probably predict. So poor diet, especially one that's high in fat, a lack of exercise because exercise actually helps to keep the blood pushing through the vessels. It makes it harder for fat to fill up there. Um, tobacco use makes the artery walls harden. Obesity, already having high blood pressure, having a family history of high blood pressure or atherosclerosis, and stress can all lead to this issue. The way that it's usually treated, there are medications which help to um, lower the amount of cholesterol in the vessels. There is also a surgery where you basically cut this part of the vessel out, remove it, and then bring these two ends together. Um, that's called a bypass. So how do we measure pressure in the vessels? When the heart pumps, there is a lot of pressure immediately leaving the heart in the vessels. That is the maximum amount of pressure that the blood will move, and that is called systolic. So in blood pressure regulations or measurements, there are two values we're looking at. We're looking at the maximum pressure of the ventricles, which is systolic pressure, and we're looking at the minimum pressure of the ventricles, which is called diastolic. So we measure how much pressure there is, at those two points and we represent that as a fraction. So we always write systolic or the most pressure at the top and diastolic the lowest pressure at the bottom and then we can kind of keep an eye on it. What is pretty typical is to have around 120 as the maximum pressure and around 80 as the minimum pressure. We want to keep right around there so that the heart is functioning properly. And we do, we take this measurement by feeling where the arteries expand and relax. And we have checked that already in class. You know what that feels like. That, as you know, is called your pulse. Some um, activities or events that can affect the pressure in your arteries and overall that will affect blood pressure and heart action. So how much blood leaves the heart every time it contracts is called stroke volume. Um, and then the cardiac output is a measure of how much blood is pumped in one minute total, right? So if you have maybe 60 beats a minute, beats per minute, and you have 70 milliliters of blood per beat, and then you have one minute, that gives you a cardiac output of roughly 4,200 uh, milliliters per minute. That's a measure of cardiac output. So if either of those numbers increase, that can affect your blood pressure and can cause it to increase as well. In the body on the whole, there's usually about five liters of blood in your heart and in all the vessels at any given time. Um, that is about one and a half gallons, give or take. If the volume of the blood in the body decreases, let's say there's you have a huge wound on the leg and it's bleeding a whole bunch. So now you've got less blood volume inside because you've got more blood outside. If the volume decreases, the pressure also decreases. The body tries to slow down how much blood it's pumping and it tries to slow down the pressure so that it's not pumping lots more blood outside. 
There are two other factors with the blood itself, not how much blood, but the content of the blood. So the first one is blood viscosity. Viscosity is a measure of how thick or how flowy the blood itself is. So high blood viscosity means that it is very thick. And low blood viscosity means that it is very thin. So if the blood is very thick, think more like syrup instead of water, obviously it's much harder to push through the vessels. So that makes the blood pressure go way, way up. The other um, effect that increases pressure significantly is peripheral resistance. So that means if there are tiny vessels or there are blockages like atherosclerosis, it causes the resistance of the vessels to increase. So resistance means how much work does the body have to do to push the blood. And if there's a lot of resistance, then it requires a lot of pressure. So these are both things that can really impact blood pressure and can lead to problems down the line. Okay, so that is it for our initial look at um, arteries, capillaries, and veins. Please answer these summary questions. Make sure that you have all of this content in your notes and then come to class with two to three discussion questions. I'll see you soon.